Welcome everyone to this year's William B. Joyner Memorial Lecture. I am John Townend, the President of SSA. It's my great pleasure to introduce our 2020 Joyner Lecturer, Julian J. Bomber, Senior Research Investigator at Imperial College London. Julian has worked for more than 30 years at the interface between seismology and earthquake engineering as both a researcher and a practitioner. Julian's research has focused on ground motion prediction and seismic hazard and risk assessment, topics on which he has published more than 130 papers. Julian has participated in numerous earthquake reconnaissance efforts and worked on seismic hazard and design inputs for major engineering projects, including the Panama Canal expansion via his service on the Seismic Advisory Board. A major focus of Julian's work has been seismic hazard assessment for nuclear facilities and for induced seismicity. His expertise in all these fields has sent him around the world from El Salvador to Turkey and many countries in between. Julian actually worked with the name behind this award, Bill Joyner, at Menlo Park in the early 1990s. Julian recalls that most days I would venture into Bill's office with questions and doubts, and while I recall that I often entered with mild trepidation, I always emerged enlightened. Today, Julian will be enlightening us as he explores an important question. Are small earthquakes a big deal? After Julian's address, we hope you'll join us on Gather, our video chat platform for this meeting, for the joiner reception. Details on how to join Gather are on the meeting homepage. And now, please join me in welcoming Julian Bomber to present the 2020 William B. Joyner Memorial Lecture. Oh, good morning to everyone. And I want to start, of course, by thanking SSA and the ERI for the honor of uh, choosing me to give the Joyner Memorial Lecture this year. And I'll dive straight into my lecture, for which I chose the title, Are Small Earthquakes a Big Deal? And I hope I'll explain what that's about. So first I'm going to ask the question, what is a small earthquake? From a seismological perspective, we might say that it's an earthquake that's big enough to rupture right through the seismogenic layer. However, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to adopt a more engineering definition that the small earthquake is one that would be excluded from probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, PSHA. So the, the what would correspond to the, the parameter M min when we're doing our hazard integrations. So what's the basis for M min? Well, a lot of things have been said and written about that. And these are all things that I've either read or been told by people who work in this field, all anonymized, of course. So I've been told it's the threshold of completeness in the earthquake catalog. It's the smallest magnitude used in recurrence relationship calculations. It's the lower limit of applicability of our ground motion prediction equations. It's chosen to make hazard calculations more efficient. I've heard people say that they use smaller values of M min, M min because they have lower values, lower levels of seismicity in their region or country. And even that using a larger value of M min leads to reduce hazard estimates. The last statement is actually true, but none of these is actually a legitimate reason or basis for why, how we choose M min. M min in PSHA, we defined in the paper a few years ago, is the lower limit of integration over earthquake magnitude such that using a smaller value may result in higher estimates of seismic hazard, but would not alter the estimated risk to the exposure under consideration. So in other words, M min is determined by risk rather than hazard. It does affect hazard, but it's chosen such as it doesn't have an impact. That those smaller earthquakes that get excluded wouldn't have an impact on risk. And that's, that definition has two immediate consequences. One is that this definition implies that seismic hazard is always related to assessment or mitigation of seismic risk. And the other is that M min is actually an engineering rather than a seismological parameter. What kind of values are used? They're usually found to be in the range between four and a half and five. Here are examples from the uh, National Hazard Map produced by the USGS, which uses five, for example, in, in the Western United States. In Europe, the European Hazard Map produced in the SHARE project adopted a value of 4.5. These are typical values. Occasionally, you see slightly smaller values for Hazard Map generation, but four is, would usually be the, the absolute limit. So with that introduction and setting that scene, I'll adopt the definition of this lecture that small earthquakes are those of magnitude smaller than five. 
and I'll assume that's in moment magnitude. The implicit assumption in PSHA is that ground shaking from earthquakes smaller than M5 does not pose a threat to engineered structures by virtue of the short duration and low energy content, even if the peak amplitude is high. So if you look at these, these plots <coughs> of earthquakes recorded on the coast of Mexico or from earthquakes at a similar kind of distance, what you really say is the influence of magnitude, not only on amplitude, but on the number of cycles, the duration of the motion, the frequency content, and ultimately the energy in the motion. And what the purpose of M-min in a rather crude way is to remove those motions, which are insufficiently energetic to pose a threat to engineered structures. So having defined M-min in terms of uh, non-energetic or low energetic levels of shaking, the question really arises, should we be talking about minimum magnitude or a minimum level of shaking? The purpose of MMIN, a restate, is to prevent inflation of hazard estimates by high amplitude, short duration, low energy motions that would not cause damage and therefore did not contribute to risk. A more appropriate approach, therefore, would actually be to define a minimum threshold of a ground motion parameter. The CAV, the cumulative absolute velocity filters, has been quite widely used in some PSHA studies. Uh, any other vector of ground motion parameters could also serve the same purpose. But in general practice, it's still the case that we use a simple magnitude cutoff, which is crude, but it, has a, it, it gets the job uh, done. Because it's related to ground motion, however, the value of M-min could also increase with increasing distance between the source and the site of interest. So for example, going back to the USGS national PSHA maps, M-min is actually 6.5 for the deep subduction earthquakes on the, in the Pacific Northwest, because such is the separation of the, subdu of the subduction zone and the, uh, the subducted slab and any location on the Earth's surface that um, anything smaller than 6.5 would not produce motions that could be considered to provoke, uh, pose a threat. So then the question, the whole purpose of this lecture, why would there be any interest in these small earthquakes, which traditionally have simply been excluded from PSHA calculations? One reason is if we're doing the assessment, seismic risk assessment of existing vulnerable building stock, which doesn't have adequate earthquake resistant design, which would apply to a lot of vernacular uh, dwellings throughout the world, masonry, rubble, masonry, adobe structures, which may be vulnerable to smaller magnitude earthquakes. And of course, in risk assessment for induced seismicity, which has become a very big topic and a cause of major societal and regulatory concern, but not particularly, but not exclusively by any means due to what's happened with the uh, wastewater injection and to some lesser extent fracking in the central and uh, eastern United States. And of course, we'll have many situations where these two combine because many cases we have earthquakes uh, induced seismicity occurring in areas that were previously of low seismicity or even aseismic. And therefore we have, we're seeing in some cases damage caused by induced or triggered events to structures that were built in regions that didn't require a high seismic, uh, high level of seismic resistant design. So then why are induced earthquakes of small magnitude a concern? Well, one of the main reasons that will be cited is that they occur at shallower depths than the traditional tectonic earthquakes. We tend to see earthquakes occurring anywhere in the top five kilometers, which is not unheard of, but is more unusual for tectonic events. The other reason I believe is, is more societal and the fact that induced seismicity, unlike natural earthquakes, are viewed as an imposed or involuntary hazard. And we are just, as beings, much more intolerant of something that's imposed upon us than a risk that we adopt, that we choose to assume ourselves or which comes from nature. An example of this from, from, from the UK is when mobile phones, cell phones were introduced here. Some masts for the, to transmit the phone signals were installed above schools. This caused uproar. It provided income for the schools, but it caused uproar amongst parents who were very concerned about the levels of radiation this was exposing their children to but the same parents were found to have no qualms at all about giving their own children a cell phone to use almost continuously even after studies show that the radiation coming from a handheld device is significantly more than from a mast above your school building but the latter is a choice and the first is imposed and i think to understand induced seismicity 
for anyone who's not benefiting directly from it, the projects causing induced seismicity it needs to be viewed from this perspective. So what are the consequences of induced earthquake shaking? Understandably, perceptible ground motion associated with industrial activities such as fracking or wastewater disposal can cause distress to those in the affected, especially if episodes of shaking are repeated. That's something that's seen very clearly. So if people are shaken repeatedly, it has an unsettling effect and people become very concerned. My own experience and what I've read suggests that the real concern in such situations, however, is that the motions can cause structure or whether the let's say, bigger or worse events are coming, which could cause structural damage and harm uh, to people. And we have seen examples of at least significant non-structural damage and some cases of minor structural damage due to earthquakes, which have been triggered by some of these anthropogenic activities, particularly when they exceed magnitude five. And I'm certainly not gonna contend that once you trigger an earthquake of above magnitude five, it's a serious concern, particularly for unreinforced masonry and other structures with poor seismic performance. The way that we've generally handled uh, induced seismicity, particularly well from injection related processes is through traffic light protocols, which are a simple system, is that you set up a um, red, yellow, sorry, green, yellow, and red uh, traffic lights based on observations of magnitude normally, but can be related to other features of the ground motion, but generally magnitude. Provided the earthquakes are below a certain magnitude, you stay in the green light, you carry on as normal. If you step into the yellow, you have to start making some adjustments. And once you pass the red light magnitude, then usually operations have to cease. And the red light thresholds are usually set such that any trailing events with larger motions that come afterwards would still avoid damaging levels of motion. And here you have a typical well, a, a representative selection of traffic light systems that have been invoked around the world, uh, mainly for fracking control. And you can see the yellow and red lights. Can, when we look at tables like this, we have to be careful in comparing them because it's not always like with like. So if you look, for example, um, the UK case has a remarkably low red light at 0.5 magnitude. You don't even see that level of earthquake size uses, even as a yellow light elsewhere. But then it also has a very somewhat different response because in the UK, red light led to 18 hour suspension. Whereas in Alberta, Canada, for example, passing the red light means that the well is permanently and, in, and immediately abandoned. But in terms of whether or not this helps with perception of earthquakes is perception is is open to debate in the uk uh, after this rather onerous traffic light system was imposed by the government and fracking operations resumed they featured in the news every two or three days with headlines like the one you're seeing here that fracking suspended following an earthquake the earthquake in this case was a magnitude 0 0.8 event and it was suspended for 18 hours. They have to talk to the regulator. A couple of days later, they can resume. But this was happening very, very frequently. And these events were on the news every day. Events that could not have been felt by anybody, even people working on 